I just hope you know this is going to be a very short sermon because I talk with my hands. And now that I only have one hand to talk with, that's half the sermon. So, what do I always tell you to say when somebody asks you, what do you believe? Yeah, the triune God, but, but what a, the Apostles' Creed, right? It, it defines the Trinity really well for us, and it's, a, it's really a starting point for you if somebody's you know, asking you that. It tells us not just about Jesus, it tells us about God the Father, the Holy Spirit. Our gospel lesson, though, today gives us another glimpse of another way to tell others who Jesus was. If you look closely, Jesus is being questioned just that by the Jews. Who are you? What are you? Because they're just astonished at everything he's doing. And he said it in a way that they would understand. But I'll tell you what, I think if they looked at us today and said the same thing, we would be like, huh? What? I, yeah, what are you talking about? So imagine that for a moment. If someone asked you who Jesus was, and you answered to them, he is the I am. There goes that deer in the headlights look, right? I know, I really honestly, unless you have a, a, a devout Jewish friend that really knows the Old Testament, have no idea what you were talking about if you said, Jesus is the I am. Well, we're going to figure that out today. Let's look at the scripture first and see what's going on. John chapter 8. Here's what's happening. The Jews are questioning Jesus. He's teaching, and he teaches like nobody else. He's healing people. Crazy. He's actually healing people. He turned water into wine. He brought a friend back from death. And get this, he cast out demons. So in their mind, that must mean Jesus is a demon. I mean, he certainly can't be God, so it's, he's got to be a, the bad person. He's got to be a demon. That's why he has all these powers, because a normal person do not do those things. There was no way he could be God. So it was his answer then that is what I want us to see today. For us, we would be lost in translation. For them, they should have grasped it right away. The very first thing he says to their, to their question, I am. I am. Now, that denotes that whatever he is, he's always been and always will be. It wasn't I was, it wasn't I'm going to be, it was I am. But there's more to it than that. To understand really what he's saying, you've got to understand the Old Testament prophecies. And I know all of you are just stoked about all those prophecies, right? <laughs> I couldn't even tell you all of them, so please, I'm, I'm joking, all right? But them being good Jews, they would have gotten it. If you look through Scripture, if you look through our Gospel of John, there are seven I am statements made by Jesus. And we're going to get into them, but in just a few more minutes. So this first I am. The Old Testament reference here would be Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. What's happening there? I'm not going to read it. But it's Moses up on the mountain in the burning bush. And now he has seen the glory of God and he says, look, when I go down from here, who, who or what do I tell the people you are? 
Remember the answer from the bush? Tell them that I am. I am who I am. That is what you say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. That's Exodus 3.14. Jesus is saying, look, that same God that Moses saw is me. I was there from the beginning of the world to the end. Remember how John describes Jesus in the book of Revelations? In the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega? The Greek alphabet begins with Alpha. And guess what it ends with? Omega. See, you guys know Greek. I'm, I'm impressed. The Jews, who he was talking to, definitely got the reference, okay? But instead of going, whoa, it's God. What did they do? They picked up stones to stone him because that's blasphemy. That is the worst thing you could ever claim to do is to be God. Oh, my. Instead of worshiping him and following Jesus, in verse 59, as I said, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Really, the, the punishment for blasphemy is death. And I love how he says Jesus hid himself. I don't know. I was trying to find out if that just meant he kind of walked into the crowd or slowly disappeared, walked back into a curtain so they couldn't. I don't know. But however, they were blinded to see in him, so they had nothing or nobody to throw a stone at. Now think about this. If there's one picture, when you think of Jesus Christ, one image, what normally pops into your head? Now, I think it's interesting. Heather brought up Christmas this morning, so that's probably in your head. You can go, oh, yeah, Christmas. But what usually do you think about? The cross, the crucifixion, Jesus hanging on the cross, bloodied and beaten and suffering. And you don't, man, I wouldn't call that a beautiful image, would you? Especially non believers, that's probably about the grossest image you could ever find. Some might say it is beautiful because we, we know the rest of the story. We know why he's hanging on that cross, and we know he doesn't remain on that cross. But there's so much more to Jesus than the cross. I know. I'm a good Lutheran, and I'm sounds like I'm straying away from the theology of the cross, and that is not what I am doing. I'm hoping to show you a beautiful Savior this morning, a beautiful picture of the man we follow, of the God we follow, Jesus Christ. So, to do that, there's much more to Jesus than just the cross and this first I am. In John 6, 22, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now, if you're like me, you know what I think of when I see the bread of life and it's not communion? That wonderful smell when you're baking bread at home and how it permeates. Or you go into a restaurant and it's like, oh, awesome. It truly fills you up. But now, the Israelites again, are going to look at it a little bit differently probably than what we do. In the Old Testament, when were they given bread? I'll give you a clue. It was out in the desert. They were ticked off at what they were eating. And so God sent them manna, bread. He was giving them bread to sustain them. But now he's giving a different type of bread. A bread that's going to fill us up, not just now, but for an eternity. For Jesus Christ is the bread of life. 
Another thing he also proclaimed, and this is one I think you truly can understand the comfort and the beauty we should see in Jesus Christ. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. How many times a storm comes through, takes out the electricity, you're scrambling to find a flashlight, or nowadays you're scrambling to find your phone so you can turn the flashlight on that's on your phone, and you're freaking out because it's dark. It's scary. Man, when that light flashes on, it's like <sighs> comfort, peace. All will be well. That is our Savior, Jesus Christ. He comes into a very dark world, and he's that bright flash of light that says, Hey, I'm here. Here's the warmth of light, not the coldness of darkness. Here's the warmth of light that you can take comfort in. To me, that's a beautiful picture. John 10, 1-18 he kind of combines two I am sayings. And it's all around a agricultural understanding, which again, most of them would have gotten. Where he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. But then he takes it one step further and says, I am the gate, the gate in which the sheep enter his pasture and care. Now, as a farm kid, I always said of all the animals we ever had, sheep were the most stupidest ones going. Maybe they were just stubborn. Maybe they were taking after me. I don't know. But think about the other pastoral picture of that. This serene, green, grassy field with sheep just feeding and being there. And there's the shepherd standing, watch over them, caring for them if they are hurt, he helps them. If they are hungry, he feeds them. If they need shelter, he gives it to them. That's our Savior. And one other thing very, he points out, though, and this is very important because this is where some people don't like our theology. I am the gate. And you only enter that gate through the great I am. Not through Buddha, not through Islam, not through Joseph, um, the Mormon dude. I should know his last name. Joe something, okay? Joseph Smith. I knew I had it there. We only enter into heaven through Jesus Christ. It's not, well, we worship this God. They worship that God. We're all of the same God. No, the great I am. He's our great shepherd. He is the gatekeeper to eternal life. Another picture that we are given, and this one we hear probably quite a bit. John eleven twenty five 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. We hear that multiple times in our liturgy at funerals. And we can take comfort in that. We do take comfort in that when we lose a, a when a lost one passes away, when we're in grief. And what again, even though it's talking about death, what a beautiful picture. Because Satan doesn't win, sin doesn't win, death doesn't win, Jesus, our shepherd, the great I am, wins. And you know what that means? We win. We'll be together with him. For an eternity. He's conquered not only sin, but he has conquered death. Now in John 14, 6, here's another one that causes a lot of angst out amongst either non-believers or other Christians. Note the air quotes, Christians. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is contrasting himself to all the different ways of the world and Satan that 
Satan's very smart, very cunning, and he can come up with some great ways of flipping the truth, of getting you to think there's other ways to heaven other than Jesus Christ. He's very good. This world is very good saying, oh, you can have good life. Come on. Make millions. Hit the lottery. You'll have an awesome life. We find true life in the great I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now this last one is one way, too, that I think we can truly understand who Jesus Christ is. When he says in John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. Again, the Israelites would have totally gotten this. It's a symbol in the Old Testament for Israel and all of the people. They were the vine of God. They were the ones that would go out and be harvested so God's word could continue on. So are we. When we are watered and washed anew in our baptism, we are part of the vine. And think about this. The leaf or the flower that comes off a of vine, what's feeding it? Who's giving it its purpose? How's it getting its nutrients? But from the vine, the great I am, we are part of that vine. And well, how beautiful is that? Now, this really is just a very fast overview of the I am statements. If you want some homework, when you leave today back there on one of the stands is the seven I am statements of Jesus. It gives you all the Old Testament background and the New Testament meaning. It really, to me, paints a beautiful, beautiful picture of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The great I am. Now, remember this. Some do see the cross as ugly and a turn off. But even in a cross, that can bring home beauty. Because we can see even more in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And God, our Father, the, the, the sacrifice he made for us, giving of his son, and Jesus giving of himself so he could die for us, a bunch of lowly sinners. And yet he loved us so much, he went to that cross, not just to die, but to rise again so that we can know we are loved unconditionally. We know we are forgiven unconditionally, and we're going to live for an eternity. And how can we know all that? Because Jesus was there from the beginning to the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And by all means, he is the great I am. And in that, we see the beauty of his love and the power it has in our lives. Amen? Amen.